Welcome, everybody. We have such an exciting episode today. We are going to be talking about everything gestational carrier and the entire process with our special guest, Alex Doth Aldridge. Alex is a married mother of six month old twins born by a gestational carrier in May 2022. So she's just a little busy. Uh, she was born in Manhattan and grew up on Long Island. She has been an early childhood educator for the past six years and lives in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, with her two children and husband. Welcome, Alex. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. So let's get a little bit of backstory here. And I know this is such a loaded question, but what sure. led you to seek out a gestational carrier in the first place? What was the journey? Excellent question. Good place to start. Um, so my husband and I knew we always wanted to uh, have a family together, um, even from when we were first dating. And um, we knew that it was going to look and feel a little bit different for us because I have a pre-existing genetic condition um, that impacts both my physical health, um, but is also transferable to children. My mother had it. My sister has it. I have it. Um, it is 100% genetic. And we talked um, a lot about how we wanted to grow our family. My sister um, went the adoption path. She has two wonderful children. Um, and my husband and I felt strongly about trying um, just to continue his genetics. Um, so we decided that surrogacy was going to be the right option for us. Um, we did a little bit of poking around, research, um, and it kind of felt right for us to start going down that path. Um, and this was all pre-pandemic when we started doing the research. Um, I actually was lucky enough to have a friend of a friend who had gone through this process um, and was expecting her twin girls at the time. Um, and so she really brought in a lot of information to our journey right at the very beginning, which was incredibly helpful. Um, so we kind of knew coming in that this was something we were really interested in doing. Um, and then once we got the ball rolling, it seemed to be a continue to be a good fit for us in terms of growing our family. Um, and that being the case, we did a lot of research, um, kind of just online. Um, we had started our, our process pre-pandemic. We pressed pause on it because COVID hit. Um, our wedding also got pushed around a little bit. We were one of those people who were scrambling with rescheduling wedding dates as well. Um, and so we ultimately started it, um, started working with our um Fertility Institute um, in Stanford, Connecticut, and our surrogacy agency in New Jersey um, during the pandemic um, in 2020. Um, that was the start of it. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Um, right in the thick of everything. And yeah. so, you know, I, from what I hear, it can take a little while to match with a gestational carrier. Yes. And so, you know, what was the process like for you? Like, how did you choose your agency? And, you know, how long did it all take? Great question. So we actually chose our agency. We worked with Reproductive Possibilities. They're located in New Jersey. Um, and it was founded by this woman named Melissa, who actually had her own surrogacy journey. Um, she has a background in law. Um, and she, when she was trying to grow her family, um, she actually went down the same surrogacy path. And so then she founded Reproductive Possibilities um, after going through her own experience, her own journey. So we chose Reproductive Possibilities because um, actually this friend of a friend had an amazing experience with them. Um, and once we uh, had a Zoom call with Melissa, who's the founder, uh, we loved her personal approach. We loved that she has a background in law. It is a smaller agency. They really take care to um, have just a really individual approach for each family, each each person going through the process. Um, so that's kind of how we found them, how we decided to work with them. Um, they will pair you up with an intended parent coordinator. That is one person who's going to be managing your case from the beginning all the way through to post birth. Um, unfortunately, our case um, and manager, consultant person uh, had to withdraw from our case because of COVID reasons, not anything to do with the, with the agency or anything else. It was all personal COVID reasons. So we ended up working with this one, the wonderful business manager of Virginia. I cannot speak high, highly enough of this woman. It was not, she is not an independent, intended parent coordinator. She is literally the business manager for this um, business. And she walked us through 
every step. She was calling us the day that our kids arrived. She literally, my husband was on the phone with her yesterday and sent her pictures. Like she really took it upon herself to be with us on our entire journey, Mm -hmm. um, which really just speaks to their approach and how Mm -hmm. they work with families. Yeah, like really um, warm and supportive and yeah. So supportive, um, real-time updates, just incredibly thoughtful about how they're interacting with families, with people who are on this journey, as it is a very sensitive journey. It can be. Mm-hmm. Um, finding our uh, our carrier, uh, she is a wonderful woman who lives in California. Um, we, she was actually only the second person that we spoke with. Um, we spoke with only one other potential candidate before her. Um, so how it works is that you kind of with this with this agency, um, you create a profile, you and your partner, or you by yourself if you're going on this journey alone create a uh, profile, um, pictures, just a little bit of background, um, and the agency will send it out to potential uh, carriers, and they can choose to set up a phone call, um, and it's a two-way approval, so you will say yes to them, they say yes to you. Um, our phone call with our carrier was lengthy, it was fun, she had questions for us, we had questions questions for her. Um, It just felt right to us. She had done this already. That was important Mm -hmm. for us. Oh, that's Uh, awesome. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, And all of this information, the agency will provide for you. So you can, you get a profile and you can review it. Reproductive Possibilities as a surrogacy agency actually does a lot of their own legal uh, forms Mm -hmm. in-house up until getting those uh, legal documents at birth, then they actually will send it to wherever your child or children are going to be born because that's where you need to have the legal documents. Mm -hmm. Um, Our children were born in California, so it was through the LA uh, court system. Got it. Um, So that's so, so great that you give us the step-by-step through that process. I am curious a bit more about, you know, like what, what was important to you? What kind of questions did you ask her? So actually our, our, Uh, case manager at the time she was helpful with kind of giving us some questions and where to start I was really curious about her previous experience Mm -hmm. um why she was doing this um you know I was really curious I, I think surrogacy can be um for for many people can be a very contentious um topic I think people can feel very strongly for or against it Mm -hmm. uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, I am personally very Mm pro-surrogacy because it has helped me have my family. Um, But I was curious about why she was doing this. What what brought her to surrogacy? Um, What'd she she say? She has had four of her own children. Mm -hmm. She has had very easy pregnancies. Mm -hmm. She likes being pregnant. She Mm -hmm. has feels great when she's pregnant. Mm -hmm. Um, She has a full-time job, Mm -hmm. um, but she has four children. So she also is looking to supplement her income. Um, And she felt strongly about helping a family come together. Mm -hmm. Um, She said, I did this, uh, she did this for another couple um, four years ago and they had twin boys. Mm -hmm. And she said it was just an incredible opportunity and experience to help another family really really come together. Mm -hmm. Um, and she had a, has a really good sense of humor Mm -hmm. about the journey. Mm -hmm. Um, when we met her in person, we ultimately met her in person, um, after our phone call. Mm -hmm. Um, and she joked, well, how I think about this is that, you know, you guys are just renting my uterus. You know, Mm -hmm. I'm not mom. (laughs) I am your oven. You're renting my uterus. And these, these are your children. This is how I think about it. I'm just kind of responsible for the easy part. That's how she kept saying it, the easy part. And I kept saying, oh, it's not the easy part, trust me. Yeah. But she had a really great sense of humor. And mm-hmm. it was incredible to find someone who not only felt passionate about helping us bring our family into reality, but also just kind of was fluid and flexible and understood that this was not a perfect process and that we really had to kind of roll with a lot of a lot of different things um and that's what really drew me personally to her but also my husband um as well yeah that's so that's so fun and it sounds like you know it made it very clear to you that she had an understanding of what this you know relationship was and and you know I'm curious about 
kind of other aspects of this. So I have oh. patients that are like, I, you know, they want to go this route. They think mm -hmm. it would be a good option for them, but then they're, you know, worried about like, what's the mother going to eat? And is she going to, you know, yeah. be healthy? And, and so like, what were your sort of sentiments around that? And how, how did you kind of process or get past the, like trying to control every aspect kind of thing? That is a really good question. And something that I actually get asked a lot, um, <laughs> uh, which it's, it's really important, I think, because you do have to give up a lot of control in this situation and as somebody I like to be in control a lot of the time um you're a so, New Yorker <laughs> uh, yes I'm a New Yorker I'm a teacher like I, I like to be in control um you know this is her body her the pregnancy that she's going to be experiencing so what however she's most comfortable um that would work for us within reason of course you know no drinking no smoking nothing like that and you can actually stipulate a lot of this in the contract that you ultimately draw up together um i know for example one of the people that i spoke with um who is on a similar journey she felt very strongly about eating all, all organic mm -hmm. um not avoiding meats or anything like that but just really eating organic foods during the the process mm -hmm. um and so that was a, a a clause that she put into her contract with her with her carrier that's so interesting um, that you can do that I had one yeah. one of my patients was talking to um she was interviewing her her options for uh gestational carrier and mm -hmm. the, the first one was like I don't eat healthy for anyone <laughs> and she didn't choose them yeah <laughs> so <that's> <laughs> like wow um, and that's something that you really you you that's why you go through the interview process you want to make sure that you're both on the same page about uh the important things mm -hmm. I think for us we were we felt confident that this individual that the woman that we went with was going to do right by her own body and do right by by our children mm -hmm. um which she totally did mm -hmm. um we also got our our children came a little bit early they were their due date was in july they were actually born in may mm -hmm. um and so for a week we were actually in california with her while she was in the hospital on bed rest trying to have them hang on until 34 weeks mm -hmm. um, gestation. And we actually, for that entire week, we got to spend a lot of time with her, which I think doesn't normally happen, especially if your carrier is all the way across the country, like ours was. Mm -hmm. um, and that was incredible because we actually got to know her really, really well. Mm -hmm. um, during that time, I bought her onion rings, burgers, milkshakes. I mean, she's at the end of a pregnancy. Like it was a very hard pregnancy for her. You're like, you're not going to do any damage at this point. You're not, they're fine. They're being monitored. It's all fine. So, you know, I think again, it's, it's not one size fits all. It is definitely a personal process. And if you feel very strongly about something in this process, um, that is why you have the very detailed contract. Um, and that's why you go through a lot of conversations and interviews interviews and if possible, an in-person meeting with the carrier before anything is signed. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's a really important piece of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's amazing. I mean, I just wonder though, like, do you have the contract, but is there any way, like, like say somebody like you have to eat organic the whole time. There's not really any way to enforce that. Right. Like is, does, yeah. the, does the, um, you know, recipient parent, like, are they paying for the organic food? Cause I could see that being sort of an argument. So that's definitely a part of it, um, in the contract, you will have incredibly detailed, um, if this happens, then this sort of situation. So for us, we, we had twins, we knew we were implanting two embryos mm -hmm. and we really hope they both were going to commit to being there. Mm -hmm. Um, and they did, mm -hmm. and they're currently screaming outside of my living room. I know, and, I can, um, hear can you hear them? Yeah. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. They're we're teething right now. It's a process. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we, we knew that we were going to have, hopefully have two. Um, if one of those embryos split and it became three, we had a full, um, full page of what if this happened with our, with our carrier. And she, was willing to do it as long as the pregnancy was viable, it was working, the babies weren't in danger, her health was not in danger. Mm -hmm. um, but then we would be on, on 
responsible for um, paying for transportation for her other children to get to and from school. Mm -hmm. um, if she was put on bed rest, we would have mm -hmm. to pay for uh, child care for her. Mm -hmm. If she was losing wages because she had to be, you know, in the hospital, we were going to be responsible for that. Ah. So you do have a lot of mm -hmm. um, just really detailed, I guess, pieces of your contract um, mm -hmm. just to make sure that you have as many safety nets as possible. Yeah, like all the what if, ifs. Right? Yes. Yeah. As well, as far as kind of making sure that they are adhering to the behavior set that they said they would, <laughs> I think again, you just kind of you're giving up part of the control unless your your carrier is closer geographically to you, which some of them can be. Mm -hmm. um, maybe there is a different way to do it. <laughs> they do them. get. <laughs> you, you build a relationship. You go out to lunch. <laughs> I don't know. I but, had one patient at one point. She was like, "Can I just?" lock her up in a hotel room and only feed her organic food and send a trainer I'm like I don't think that's ethical <laughs> I mean I think if you make knowledge. it worth their time yeah, exactly. like they, they can charge more for that um, well I was thinking which, about it and I was like if you put me in a certain kind of hotel with <laughs> yeah maybe like, that actually sounds like a nice little vacation honestly I don't know um they do get regular checkups they yeah. do so at the beginning um for us, the way our uh, fertility clinic went through the process is that every medical record, everything gets sent through them first, even though they are in Connecticut and our and our carrier was in California. She came for her marathon day. That's what they call the full physical workup, psych eval, everything. Um, so she has to be there in person to do that at our fertility clinic. They will not implant unless um, she does this, mm -hmm. um, and she has to be approved for everything, her physical, um, her psych situation, everything has to be approved by our fertility clinic. Mm -hmm. Once that is there, they still get all of her medical records. Even if she's going to doctor's appointments in California, in her home, they still get everything until she is confirmed 10 weeks, um, gestation then they release her to her ob where she is um but we can still request anything that is medically around the pregnancy intended parents can request mm -hmm. um and so we got ultrasounds we got you know blood work for her making sure that she's healthy and um you can stipulate how much information you want um again there is some privacy around she is a, a person and you need yeah. to respect that um mm -hmm. which the medical um professionals really are clear on where the boundaries are um okay. but you know we we received everything that we asked for and and that's one way that to um kind of keep up with the pregnancy not necessarily check in on you know how how she what she's doing with her choices but more like making sure that everything's going the way it should the scans are good heartbeats are strong um you know we couldn't go to any of her appointments she was I mean we we could have gone if we wanted to fly to California I I was teaching I couldn't really take time off um so we my husband went virtually to two of her appointments on FaceTime. I couldn't make it because of the time difference. I was always working. Um, and so, you know, we, we tried to be as involved as we could again with the, you know, geographical difference. It was just a little bit. Logistically. Hands -off. Hands -off. But I mean, yeah, yeah. Like you, you, like you said, you can be as, you know, involved as you kind of want to be. And if not, then yeah. you just, you kind of surrender, you trust, right? Yeah. Otherwise the, it, the whole thing could drive you crazy the whole time. Yes, um, yes. And, and I think probably that that's a lot like of what of it, it is like trusting and doing a gut check. Like you met this yep. person, it felt right. Yep. You make that choice, you make the decision and then, and then you kind of let go and say, this is what we're doing. And it's definitely a leap of faith. I mm -hmm, think um, you, you do have to kind of make peace with that at a certain point in the process. Um, I think that was a lot easier for my husband than, than for me. Mm -hmm. I also, in my own experience, I have known for many years that I was not going to be the one carrying our children or our child. Um, and so intellectually, I knew that, um, you know, I, I made my peace with it in, in my heart, in my head, um, going through this process and, and hearing about her morning sickness, hearing about 
the kicking, hearing about the heartburn. It was hard to hear that because, you know, I, I was not the one who was doing this for my family. I was not able to provide this, this piece of the puzzle. Um, so that took a bit of time to really reconcile myself with that, with that whole situation. What do you I think, say sorry, Kendra, yeah, what, like, no, what, no, please. what do you think, because that, that was one of my questions for you is like, you know, what yeah. were sort of some of the emotional or psychological hurdles that you had to get over? What mm -hmm. do you think shifted it for you that you, that you, you know, were able to get to that point where it didn't feel like you were, because, because what you just said to me is like that you weren't able to do it. Right. And, mm -hmm. and that that was something, you know, negative, but you know, yeah, I think candidly uh therapy every week i mm -hmm. love my therapist um mm -hmm. i've been seeing her for years she's fantastic mm -hmm. um and so and she was a big part of this of this journey with me we we talked about it every single week sometimes more than once a week mm -hmm. um having the reassurance of my husband he did not care if i was pregnant or not he was so excited to be a dad mm -hmm. um and also just trusting the fact that they were going to be okay mm -hmm. once we got past that 20 week marker and you know we were building toward oh my goodness they're actually going to be here soon that really helped me kind of let go of like oh I have some sort of failure on my part um and it didn't even matter anymore because they were coming. Um, and then it really, really clicked when they were there. And all of a sudden, everything about like me not being able to carry, not not being, you know, feeling them kick inside of me didn't matter anymore because they were already here. Mm -hmm. um, and that really, really helped. I would say I also tried to do as much nesting as possible. I use that term kind of broadly and loosely because again, this is, these are my first kids. These are probably my last kids. I don't see myself going through this again. Um, and I, I didn't want to buy all these things and then God forbid something went wrong, but I did recognize that in this process, I needed to have some physical artifacts that prove to, to everyone, to me really that we were expecting even if my my stomach wasn't growing and I didn't buy maternity clothes and I wasn't having a baby shower that it was still real yeah. so I bought um just some little baby clothes mm -hmm. um just uh, just like three different little things mm -hmm. and uh some little books um and I made a little album on my phone of like all the ultrasound pictures that our, our wonderful carrier sent us um, and bump photos. She would send us like a little bump photo sometimes. So just trying to build in as much as uh, just factual check-ins for myself, like this is real, this is happening. Um, that was incredibly helpful for me um, as Those well. Those are really good um, tips. And also it sounds like just kind of arriving at the destination helped you that you were like, oh wait, didn't really matter how I got here because I'm here and we're yes. friends. And, and they came fast and early and they spent a month in the NICU, which was in its own way, incredibly helpful because my husband and I got kind of a little breathing space mm -hmm. to say, oh my gosh, okay, we have kids now. Mm -hmm. um, but all was again, another piece of, um, I wouldn't go ahead and say trauma, but I would say it's, it's another challenge, another hurdle of building a family that we didn't necessarily expect. So we talked a little bit about mental and emotional challenges um, in this process. And it was so helpful to hear your perspective on that and you know, what helped you get over it. Mm -hmm. What surprises um, did you have in this process, if any? <laughs> so I think the biggest surprise, one of the, one of the biggest surprises, um, you know, going in, you kind of have to have your eyes open that it's expensive. Um, my husband and I knew that we were budgeting. We, um, anticipated it was going to be a significant, uh, financial commitment. Um, I think the frequency and the amount of payments that you kind of have to have ready in your back pocket, um, just took us a little bit by surprise um, because you are responsible for um, everything from the payments for the fertility medication that your egg donor is going to take. It's a little bit unexpected um, in terms of just allocating 
money and the pacing with which you kind of have to have it ready. Mm-hmm. Um, that being said, we, we managed it, but it was, I think, something that took us a little bit by surprise. Um, the second thing I would say is that we... We were surprised by when they arrived. I mean, we knew that they were gonna come a little bit early because we were planning to do a scheduled C-section. They were healthy, they were fine. Our carrier's water broke, um, she was not in labor. So it was a very confusing birth week, I would call it. It was a bit unexpected in the journey. I think we had kind of, especially my husband, he was like, I've got time. It's fine because you know I'm not growing bigger by the day. It was a little bit kind of removed from our from our day to day, and you know being thrust into that so quickly was was a bit unexpected, a bit of a curveball. Um, that being said, you go in you go into this process knowing it's not perfect, knowing that you will have to pivot. Um, you will have to update expectations. You will have to update your bank account. You will have to update a lot of different things. The way you think about um, communicating with somebody who's carrying your children. I had grand ideas about what I thought it was going to be like, and you just, you change as, as you go. Um, so I think that was, those were two big curveballs thrown our way. Um, you make <laughs> sacrifices and you change your mind about things. I mean, um, but you know, I, I, changed how I thought about our communication. I changed, um, you know, how I thought about welcoming kids into this world. I didn't think I was going to be on a red eye to, you know, LA, um, walking away from my classroom, my students who I felt so bad, I didn't finish the school year with them. Um, The other thing I would say, and I'm circling back to your previous question, you know, curveballs, what I did not expect. Walking around Brooklyn with twins, people stop you all the time and say, oh my God, you look so good for just having babies. And I feel like it doesn't, (laughs) sometimes I say, oh, thank you, because I just don't know what else to say. Um, My husband also told me that I had to stop saying, oh no, I I didn't have them, I stole them. He said that was not okay. Um, (laughs) Not okay to say to strangers. Um, I thought it was funny. I think Uh, it's really funny. (laughs) But, but it's, it's thank you. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah but it's, you a, know, it's a good, uh, you know, because like you know where, where they're coming from, they're just assuming. Like it's obviously yeah. like nobody should just assume, right? Exactly. So, mm-hmm. and my sister kind of warned me because she had adopted both of her children. She said people are going to stop you and say, "Oh my god, you look amazing for just having given birth." Mm-hmm. And so then I kind of reframed it in my mind, and I was like, "Well, why do we have to tell women that they look amazing after giving birth? Like totally. they grew a human inside of mm-hmm. them, yeah. maybe more than one." They, yeah pushed it out or got it surgically cut out of them, which is so badass. Mm-hmm. And they don't have to look good after they give birth. Totally. Like and also new parents, parents. New yeah. parents don't have to look put together. I, yeah. I like I walk around my neighborhood in sweatpants a lot of the time because I've been up since 4 a.m. Like yeah. so I was I started reframing saying focusing more on the kids instead of on me. So if somebody says, Oh, you look amazing, I'm like, they are doing so well, they're really healthy. Thank you for noticing. Mm-hmm. So I kind of shift perspective over to the kids instead of onto me. Um great. so it's just, you know, mm-hmm. we really are celebrating having a family and having these two healthy, very loud, as you can hear. <laughs> Uh, children. So I think, you know, it was, unex- I, I, again, intellectually knew that people were going to kind of assume that I had given birth. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, in the day to day, depending on how I'm feeling, sometimes I take it more personally than others. But for the most part, I think my, my way of processing that and getting through it is that just refocus your energy on them instead of on me. Yeah. And um, rather than trying to like explain yourself or the situation to strangers or people you don't really care about um you know and and there's a time and a place to have the discussion um if you so feel so choose to to share and I'm so happy to share I think one of the things that I personally love about this process is that it it is important for everyone but you know women because we tend to be in that role of like either we're pregnant or we think we should be pregnant or we feel like we if, if you want a family and many people do not want a family and I think that is an amazing decision on your own my sister-in-law does not want children she's an amazing aunt to my two kids um it's very brave you, actually to decide not to have a family as exa- a woman, yes because you're going to be and, asked all the time mm-hmm. and um and my husband and I actually really we went through 
a lot of soul searching at the beginning, knowing about my health, knowing that this was going to be a non-linear path. Mm -hmm. Do we want children? Mm -hmm. How badly do we want children? What, what is, that is the overarching question that began this journey. And we really went back and forth. Mm -hmm. Um, I work with children every single day in my job. I love my job. I love teaching. Um, I have a niece and a nephew. I have so many cousins who have kids. I have friends who have kids and it is a huge responsibility. It is a huge commitment. And so we really thought very deeply about, do we want do we want to have a family? How do we, is this something that is really important to us? And we ended up deciding that, yes, it, it really was important, is important to us. But through that process and through that conversation, we really respect people who choose not to bring children into this world. Mm -hmm. um, it is an imperfect world. It is mm -hmm. a huge commitment to bring a child into this world. And, um, a lot of respect for people to choose not to do that. And being um, a parent is hard. Um, yeah. You're constantly worried about doing things wrong and screwing them up. And the judgment you know, stuff too. that we probably will, you know? Um, yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so and, so and cool. being imperfect. I think, yeah. I think it's okay to recognize that like, there's no such thing as perfect parenting. There's no such thing as, you know, if you're on your phone one day it's fine and you'll your kids are going to be fine if they're doing tummy time and you check your email or you know if you need to go take a shower you can put them in their bouncy chairs right outside the door and you can like hear them from there if your partner is unavailable or you don't have child care like it, these things are okay to do and talk about mm -hmm. um and I I think that my journey has I'm very open with with our journey with my journey in in this process and I really appreciate connecting with other people who have a non-linear, non-traditional, non-typical process of growing a family um, because it's becoming more and more common and there's all the stigma and judgment and instead of supporting each other, we're kind of tearing each other down and nitpicking decision-making. And yeah. I think it's important to be supportive, especially for, for women who are going through IVF for the 15th, 16th time and they're alone and they're upset. And you know, I didn't have to go through that, but I, I knew that at the beginning. So I kind of already got that out of the way. Um, it's important to talk about it. It's important yeah. to bring it up in conversation and to recognize that there is no one mm -hmm. size fits all for yeah. becoming a baby. And to try to just get past, you know, um, your own beliefs about things mm -hmm. to, to, and try to be, you know, have compassion for other people's situations and making different decisions, taking alternate paths to yes. parenthood. Yeah. I agree, but I, you know, I, you know, there's, we, we all have a lot of work to do, um, on our, our ability to a step inside somebody else's shoes. Maybe, you know, some have more work to do than others. Mm -hmm. So before we part today, Alex, what would you, you know, say to, to the moms to be out there and the parents to be, um, who are considering this path? I would say, um, go into it with a very open mind, mm -hmm. but trust in the process. Mm -hmm. um and it is a hundred percent worth everything that you are doing the sacrifices that you're making because at the end of it you do come out with your family mm -hmm. and that and that is that was our goal going in and if that is your goal in in you know thinking about this process maybe starting this journey um you know, do the research, talk to people, reach out to people. I mean, even if you see a post in a, in a Facebook group or, you know, a friend of a friend, ask to talk to them about their, their journey, because you can learn so much just from talking to other people. Mm -hmm. Um, and just trust that you will get there. You, you will definitely get there. I mean, all told the, our process was about two years. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was totally worth it. Mm -hmm. I, I would do it again for these two kids in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. I don't know about doing it for two more kids in the future. I'm kind of <laughs> running out of space in my apartment, mm -hmm. but you know, for, for these two, you, I would move the world for them again. Mm -hmm. down. That's so perfect. Thank you so much, Alex, for being thank with us so and much. sharing your story. Yeah. Well, thank you for letting me 
share and then talk about these these important important topics. I appreciate it.